Okay, we'll start tonight with a reading from the Apocalypse. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest render reward to thy servants, the prophets and the saints, and to them that fear thy name, little and great, and shouldest destroy them who have corrupted the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his testament was seen in his temple. And there were lightnings and voices and an earthquake and great hail. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed the sun and the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. And being with child, she cried, travailing in birth and was in the pain to be delivered. And there was seen another sign in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and on his head seven diadems, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon was angry against the woman and went to make war with the rest of her seed, who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So far, the apocalypse of St. John, chapters 11 and 12. Once upon a time in 17th century Spain, two men, serious and determined religious priests, knocked on the door of a cloistered convent of conceptionist nuns. They asked to speak with the mother abbess. Their request was granted, even though the abbess was very ill at the moment and had to be carried down from her sick bed to see the priests. They were inquisitors signed to ask this little mother a series of 80 questions. She knelt down for three hours each morning and each afternoon before these trained theologians of the church even though she was quite sick. However, she did recover her health as the questioning continued for 11 days. So holy was this abbess that no complaint escaped her lips, but only humble, thoughtful, and sincere answers to the questions. When they were finished with this mystic, they knew they had met their match, that they were working with a true saint, one enlightened by God's Holy Ghost. Her inquisitors found her blameless and praised her virtue, her charity, and her intelligence. They thanked her and begged her for prayers and that she would help them in the future and even write to them. For her part, having previously feared such a trial and who could blame her, she came to a new appreciation of the Inquisition's role in keeping the faith pure and spotless. This mother abbess was the venerable Mother Mary of Agreda, author of The Mystical City of God. If you've not read this excellent book, and there's an abbreviated version that I recommend, please consider doing so. It is one you will want to revisit. Among the things discussed in those trying conferences were how this little mother had bilocated to the southwest of America, to Texas and New Mexico, to catechize the Humano Indians. She never left her convent. They called her the Lady in Blue. She taught them about God and the necessity of baptism. And when they finally found a priest to wash them in the heavenly waters of regeneration, some 200 Indians were instantaneously cured in one day by receiving their blessing after being baptized. These inquisitors also asked the Venerable Mother about a litany she composed to Our Lady, most notably the invocation, Sphere, Sphere of God's Omnipotence. They were wondering what this meant. This is a very interesting title you've given Our Lady. Are you sure this is accurate? And they were satisfied with her answers. She passed on all levels. She was authentic. 
May God be praised in his saints. So tonight, let's take a look at this most amazing invocation of Our Lady that Venerable Mother Mary of Agreda gave us. Let's use this as our theme, connecting it to a title given to Our Lady in the Litany of Loreto, the title Virgo Potens, which means Virgin Most Powerful. In Latin, Virgo Potens, Sphere of God's Omnipotence. Well, St. Jerome said, Death through Eve, life through Mary. St. Bernardine of Siena added that every grace which is communicated to this world has a threefold origin. It flows from God to Christ, from Christ to the Virgin, and from the Virgin to us. Thus, St. Philip Neri liked to say, to begin and end well, devotion to our Blessed Lady, the Mother of God, is nothing less than indispensable. Now, from these statements, from these saints alone, we can see what Venerable Mother Mary of Agreda was indicating in her lovely invocation, sphere of God's omnipotence. Now, many things could be said about how God always works within the realm of the Virgin Mary. Does he have to? Absolutely not. He's God. He chooses to. And what he wants to do, we should want to do. If he does this, we should love it. He's chosen this. Therefore, we conform. So he always works within the realm of the Virgin Mary, but let's turn to the sacred scriptures to see some evidence for this astonishing element of God's saving plan. Now, one way to put this marvelous truth on display is to consider the literary device present in the sacred scriptures known as an inclusio, an inclusion. Inclusions are like bookends. Beginning and ending a particular passage or a section of scripture with the same word or idea. A more technical definition is given here. In the Bible, an inclusio is a literary device based on a concentric principle, also known as bracketing or as envelope structure, which consists of creating a frame by placing similar material at the beginning and at the end of a section. And I'll give you a couple of examples in a moment. So you're beginning and the ending of some section with the same word or idea. You bracket it. You get bookends to tell you something about that particular section. And let's look at an example. The genealogy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is found in St. Matthew's Gospel, has inclusio. Okay, so we looked at the very first passage, Matthew 1.1, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So Christ, David, Abraham is mentioned in the first verse. And it goes on about all who flow from Abraham on down. Then it ends 17 verses later like this. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the transmigration of Babylon are 14 generations. And from the transmigration of Babylon to Christ are 14 generations. Now you see how St. Matthew starts with the name Christ and he ends with Christ. This is an inclusio. What's the significance? When we remember that the sacred scriptures have God as their primary author, these inclusios end up being much more than just a neat literary device. They tell us things about God's divine plan. In the genealogy given by St. Matthew, for example, it shows that Christ is the cause of all life, all generation. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end, as we read elsewhere in the scriptures. So in examining the books of the Holy Bible, we know and we hope to show today that God placed several inclusios having to do with Our Lady in these books, having to do with a woman, all of which point to her relationship with our Lord and the salvation of mankind. 
All of which point to this basic principle. God, Almighty, Creator and Redeemer, always works within the sphere of Our Lady, making her the Virgin most powerful. Virco potens. What is more, these inclusions, scriptural bookends for Our Lady, that I plan on showing you tonight, are sort of like an onion, having multiple layers of inclusion. So let us start with the outermost shell and work to the innermost. I am sure that this scriptural onion of inclusions is more wonderful than I'm explaining to you tonight, more mysterious, but at least these will give you some fuel for meditation and study, some idea of what God's plan for the Virgin Mother Mary, the woman, really encompasses. Let's go to the first inclusion. Now, we've given you four that we're going to go through in the scriptures. They're all contained within the outer. It goes in, in, in. So, salvation history, God's battle plan, physical life of Christ, and Christ's public life. And we'll go through these. First inclusion. Let's start at the beginning of the Bible. The first time we hear about Our Lady, the woman, is mentioned in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will put enmities between thee and the woman, and thy seed and her seed. She shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie in wait for her heel. So this is the Proto-Evangelium. It's the first time the woman is mentioned. But notice what's being spoken of here. A woman, her offspring, and battle. Three big things. Battle with the ancient serpent and his offspring. The last reference in the scriptures about Our Lady is in the book of the Apocalypse, the last book of the Bible, namely chapter 12 part of which we heard at the start of this conference. Notice of what the main concepts being portrayed were in that section. A woman clothed with the sun, her offspring are mentioned, and battle with the ancient serpent who has grown from a snake to a terrible dragon. Now, given the nature of God's inclusios, his bookends, we can conclude that all that goes on in between involves these very same things. The woman, her offspring, the devil, and his offspring. There's going to be a battle. Life on this earth is a warfare. We cannot escape it. It is, as it were, every moment in time, from the beginning to the end of salvation history, needs the woman, needs her offspring to win victory over the devil, over the dragon, and all his wily ways and his wily minions. Here then we see the sphere of God's theater of operation. This is the realm in which he works. This is where the church militant lives. What's the significance? An important message is on display here. Just as we start with the woman in some mysterious way, the world will end with the woman. So too, all that is good, true, holy, happening in between, somehow will need her as well. All that goes on in between these bookends involves these very same important things. Every moment in time, from the beginning to the end of salvation in history, needs the woman, her offspring, to win victory over the evil dragon and his minions. This is the sphere of God's operation. As St. Jerome said, death through Eve, life through Mary. Let's go to the next layer. That's the outer layer. But believe it or not, there's another layer outside of that one. We'll cover that later. And it's not so direct in the scriptures as these inclusios. The next level, second inclusio of Our Lady, go in one level, onion layer, biblical onion. This is the inclusio of the woman as the Ark of the Covenant, found in the second book of Moses. Genesis is the first book of Moses. Exodus is the second book. 
Here we find Our Lady is typified and prefigured by the Ark of the Covenant, that sacred vessel made by Moses of incorruptible setem or acacia wood completely overlaid with gold on the inside and out. The lid or cover had two golden cherubim with their wings outstretched. It's called the mercy seat. They were stretched toward each other. The ark was made to house the Ten Commandments. That's the heart of the old law. But later, after crossing the Jordan, a golden jar of manna was placed therein, as well as Aaron's budding rod. The ark was Israel's most valued treasure, and so it was fittingly placed in the Holy of Holies, Israel's most holy place. When Moses had any trouble... With the journey to the promised land, and we know he had lots, he would go before the ark and receive instruction and courage on how to perform and fulfill the holy will of God. For Moses, the ark replaced the burning bush. Finally, we know that the ark was especially powerful. Recall how it dammed up the Jordan so people could walk by without getting wet. And it was in high flood tide. It brought down the heavily fortified city of Jericho. So with the ark, all things were possible for the Israelites. During their sojourn in the desert, the Israelites failed at the foot of the mountain. We know that. They worshipped the golden calf. We heard about it in the lesson last Sunday. This happened despite all the many wonders they experienced on leaving Egypt and dwelling at the base of the mountain with the cloud on top and all the lightning and thunder. They're down there sinning, making a golden calf. Now, why this failure? Well, one might say the reason for it is that the Israelites didn't have the Ark of the Covenant yet and all it contained. They were not inside the sphere of God's power as the ark was still being revealed to Moses in the clouds on Sinai. It is a fact, dearly beloved, it is a fact that once Israel had the ark, they did not fail again as they made their way to the promised land. Various individuals and groups failed, but not the people as a whole. They never failed again after that. Of no little significance is how this very same ark was later captured by the Philistines due to the impure priests' sons of Heli. Yet the Philistines were forced to return it unharmed. It could not be touched without death ensuing. The best they could do was return it back to the chosen people of God, if you know the story. Now, Due to the Babylonian captivity, the same ark was taken out of the Holy of Holies by Jeremiah the prophet to be kept safe in a cave on Mount Nebo. But the cave where it was placed was mysteriously lost. This is recounted in the second book of Maccabees. So, you may get on the internet today and look up Ark of the Covenant and I'll show you places down in Africa. Look, here's the Ark of the Covenant. It's being guarded by this guy. Folks, don't fall for that nonsense. This is the Ark of the Covenant. Do you understand? This is the most valued treasure of the Israelis. What are they really fighting for over there? The temple, Mount, the Dome of the Rock, where well, the Muslims are. And they're trying to get that from them. Give us our property. No, this is ours. And they're going to fight over it until the death. And you think they're going to let the Ark of the Covenant sit down in some little room down in Africa, if they think that's the real ark, nothing's going to stop the Israelis from going down there and getting that. They know this is not the real ark. Besides, we have sacred scripture, folks. We've got the revealed word of God. We have the second book of Maccabees that describes the loss of the ark in the cave under the prophet Jeremiah. Now, a prophecy is given at the same time by Jeremiah. This ark is prophesied to be found. And when it is found, we know the world is going to come to an end shortly thereof. Now, so St. Elias is said to come at the end of time. He's going to be the one that finds it for the sake of the Jews. 
who will convert en masse at the time. We have this prophecy from Blessed Dionysius of Lutzenberg, proved prophecy of the church, 17th century. He said, after the discovery of the Ark of the Covenant, Enoch and Elias will restore the Holy Sacrament of the altar. Remember, the Antichrist will suppress the mass. They restore it. Because of the fact that the Ark of the Covenant will be found in the possession of the two holy prophets, Enoch and Elias, and not in the Antichrist's hands, the Jews will recognize that Jesus Christ is the true Messiah. A great throng of Jews from all lands will then make their way to Mount Nebo. Thank you, Dionysius. Blessed Dionysius of Luxembourg. It is then the Jews will come to believe in the Holy Eucharist, the true manna. And the virginal woman, the lady, the living Ark of the Covenant. And they will submit themselves to the authority of the church, the rod of Aaron. Like Moses of old on Mount Nebo, seeing the promised land, the Jews will attend Mass and see the doorway to the promised land of heaven open up through the sacrament, through the consecration. They will convert as a people. They will see the Lord as the Lamb of God and the Blessed Virgin as the highest honor of their race. Our Lady is the fulfillment of this ark. Seen most especially in her visitation of St. Elizabeth and later in the Tilma of Juan Diego. She is with child. The covenant is inside of her. The new covenant. Who is Christ? At the visitation, the forerunner, St. John the Baptist, danced like David of old before this most honorable and sacred ark. This house of gold. She is the incorruptible Ark of the Covenant present in the Holy of Holies of Heaven as seen by St. John in the reading we heard at the head of this conference, which read, And the temple of God was opened in heaven and the Ark of His Testament was seen in His temple. That is, the Ark not made by human hands. In the temple not made by human hands. In the holiest place, it's the queen of all saints and angels. As the house of gold, she is the immaculate conception, completely free of all sin, stain, or blemish on the inside or the out. As the seat of wisdom and mercy, God comes down into this ark such that all light and grace flow from her as it did from the ark of old so long ago for Moses. So inside of her womb is the true bread of life, the manna from heaven, Christ Jesus he is the new law. He is the new law that is living, loving, and as we hear from St. Paul, more piercing than any two-edged sword, reaching unto the division of the soul and the spirit, of the joints also unto the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. He is the high priest that pierced the heavens, as well as the Lord of lords and the King of kings, as symbolized by the staff of Aaron. Blessed Mary, had the Son of God, the priest, the prophet, and the king of the universe in her womb, and she was not consumed. This is the woman that encompassed the man, the God-man. This is the virgin most powerful, Virgo potens. This is the sign as deep as the netherworld and as high as the highest heavens. Yet to complete this inclusion, to complete this inclusion, the last time the Ark of the Covenant is mentioned in the sacred scriptures is indeed what we have heard. The last verse of the Apocalypse, chapter 11. So you see how these inclusions are layered like an onion. Remember that chapter 12 is the one where we find the closing of the first inclusion with the woman clothed with the sun. And I'll give you a full diagram in a moment. So this Ark seen by the eagle eyes of St. John in heaven above, is not the one that Moses made. This is not the wood box, gold overlaid inside and out, taken up into heaven. That's not what it is. This is Our Lady. This is the living ark, the immaculate conception made by God for His Son. The presence of this living ark in heaven is scriptural proof of the woman's assumption, and this has been dogmatically defined by Pope Pius XII in 1950. 
What can be learned from this inclusion? We know that the ark and what it contains prefigure the woman and her offspring. This inclusion is very important because the Ark of the Covenant and its most sacred contents show us in symbol form what the most effective means of fighting the battle with the ancient serpent will involve. So this is like God's battle plan. And it'll have four elements. First, devotion to the Ark itself by praying the rosary daily by making a total consecration of ourselves to her. We place ourselves and all that we have in the ark. We give it to her and it is kept safe, untouchable by the devil, to be used by Our Lady as she deems fitting. Sometimes we don't want to let go of things. This is all hers. When we do that, the devil can't come to us. This puts us within the sphere of God's omnipotence. Besides, Our Lady asks this of us, Ephatima, consecration to her immaculate heart. So, first of all, devotion to the ark itself. Now to the contents. Second of all, we have devout use of the most blessed sacrament, the golden jar of manna. Through frequent attendance at the Holy Mass, where we adore our Lord, made present on the altar through the priest. We receive Holy Communion always devoutly and in a state of grace. And we adore our Eucharistic Lord outside of Mass when possible, making visits to the Blessed Sacrament. Number two, golden jar of manna, devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. Number three, regular use of the Sacrament of Confession through which the shepherd of the sheep, using the rod of authority, will bind and loose our sins, healing us of all wounds, working miracles of grace in our souls. Number four, frequent study. We have the stone tablets. We're to study, we're to learn, we're to contemplate and reflect upon the sacred scriptures, the teachings of the church and the lives of the saints. We're to study. So we got the ark, we got the golden jar of manna, we got the, the rod of authority, and we've got the stone tablets. The ancient God-given plan, summarized by these four things, will bring decisive victory over the serpent turned dragon and his minions. And I have this on the authority of sacred scripture. Remember the construction of the ark. It had a top that was called the mercy seat, in which God is said to be enthroned upon the cherubim. If you have a computer program for your Bible, do a word search, enthroned upon the cherubim, and you'll find this in multiple places in the Bible. This is his throne. That's why Our Lady is seen often with our Lord in her arms. This is my mercy seat. This is my throne. And to this can be added another repeated phrase of the scriptures, under his wings. Under his wings. We go to Psalm 90 then. And we see this fulfilled. So those who approach the throne of grace, the mercy seat of God, who is the woman, and put themselves under his wings in total consecration, will be saved. Listen to Psalm 90. Describe what is possible for such souls dedicated to the ark and its sacred contents. Dewey Reams. Psalm 90, 13th verse. All of it is powerful. I'm just going to give you a few. Thou shalt walk upon the asp and the basilisk, and thou shalt trample underfoot the lion and the dragon. That's Our Lady. She's going to do that for you if you're under the wings. Because he hath hoped in me, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he hath known my name. He shall cry to me and I will hear him. I am with him in tribulation. I will deliver him and I will glorify him. And I will fill him with length of days and I will show him my salvation. Wow. Life, victory, power over sin and death, granted by God's omnipotence, is found inside this sphere. That's the second inclusio of our lady. Let's go to the third. This encompasses the physical life of His Majesty, our Lord and Savior, 
while he was on earth. So, the beginning of this inclusion is the incarnation and even the nativity. Here's our Lord, the Word of God, made flesh in the womb of the Virgin, being born. Mary is mentioned by name both times. But now, how does it end? When he leaves the world, physically he ascends into heaven. And her name is mentioned. Mary, Mary, Mary. The woman was present both times. Thus, his coming among us as a man starts with the virgin and it ends with her presence on Mount Olivet. In other words, Blessed Mary encompassed his whole physical existence on earth. Just as she was there at the beginning, so too was she present at the end and logically and somehow mystically, all that passed in between. The Venerable Mary of Agrita explains how this was particularly true during our Lord's holy passion. She writes, She felt in her own virginal body all the torments of Christ our Lord, both interior and exterior. On account of this conformity, we can say that also the Heavenly Mother was scourged, crowned, spit upon, buffeted, laden with the cross, and nailed upon it. For she felt these pains and all the rest in her purest body. But she didn't show the physical wounds, but she felt them all. And so sometimes these pictures show her almost fainting away at the foot of the cross. And people misunderstand that to be weakness. It's not. Christ is dying. She's feeling his death. And she's not dying. She comes really close. And this is why St. Bernard and St. Bernadine of Siena and others say, that Our Lady suffered more than all of the human race combined. All of the martyrs, all the martyrs cannot equal the suffering of Blessed Mother. This is why she was right there with our Lord the whole way. What's the significance? Well, it shows that the life of Christ is to be studied, followed, and imitated at all points each in the degree that one is capable. But no one is able to reach the level of imitation of the woman. Thus again, we see her as Virgo Potens, the sphere of God's omnipotence. Let's go to the next level. Blessed Mary's fourth inclusion. His public life. Public life of His Majesty is bracketed. Okay, the woman was there at its beginning, ushering it in at Cana in Galilee as it was through her intercession that Christ's first public miracle was wrought. And, of course, we hear that in the second chapter of John. And the wine failing, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus saith to her, Woman, what is that to me and to thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother saith to the waiters, Whatsoever he shall say to you, do ye. Notice our blessed Lord calls her a woman at this significant moment. Now, when do we find her called woman last of all by our Lord, but at the very end of his public ministry as he lay dying on the cross? Again, from St. John's Gospel we hear, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary of Cleophas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus, therefore, had seen his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith to his mother, Woman, behold thy son. After that, he saith to his disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Again, to live well, to die well, To work well, one must be inside the sphere of God's omnipotence. So these inclusios put on display that the role of the woman, Blessed Mary, is essential to the plan of Almighty God. She's present at the beginning of salvation history. We know by the prophecy of the book of the Apocalypse that somehow she will be there at the end as well. And we have seen many signs. She's present at all that goes in between. And this is why she was born. This means the woman has something to do with the last days of the world and of the church. And if we're wise, 
We will want her to be a part of our last days and our hours as well. For in this lies a mystery and much wisdom, namely that God works through the woman. This is the sphere of his omnipotence. Once again, does he have to? No, he chooses to. And because he chooses it, we choose it too. So you'll hear Protestants say, oh, God doesn't have to do that. He's all powerful. But God did do it. And since he did it, I want to do it too. I want to be a part of God's plan. I don't want to make God think like me. I want to think like God as he thinks, do things like he teaches me and how he has revealed it to me. I've just shown you a revelation given to us by God. This is how he works. Although we have covered the scriptural bookends, layers of inclusions, we can't just end there. There's more. For there are more layers. There are two more that mirror those of our Lord's physical and public life on earth. And these mirror-like inclusions involve the church as a whole and her members in particular. So, on Pentecost Sunday... Our Lady opened a most important inclusio for all men to enter, for all men to enjoy. For on that day, the mystical body of Christ was born visibly, through which God communicates his truth and grace to all men, outside of which there's no salvation. The woman was present. Now, in order to understand what happened in that upper room, we have to step back and recall that the woman is the Ark of the New Covenant, not made by human hands, completely fulfilling what was symbolized by the Ark of the Old Covenant, which was made by human hands. Once again, in the Old Testament, when Moses needed to speak with God to receive strength and guidance from God, where did he go? He went to the Ark of the Covenant, and God would come down and overshadow that Ark with his presence, symbolized by the cloud. The same is true of the apostles on Pentecost. They were in need of guidance, strength, courage, knowledge. They were not just gathered with the woman, but around her. And before the woman, who is the fulfillment of the ark of old, she's the new mercy seat and the throne of grace to whom the Holy Ghost comes and overshadows. She gave birth to the hierarchy of the church without entering into it. I think someone needs to tell that to these women who want to be ordained priests. Our Lady is not a priest. But she gave birth to the priesthood, to the hierarchy of the church. She never entered into it. So just as the presence of the most... Virgin Mary, Blessed Virgin Mary, powerful in her intercession, was essential at the formation of Christ in her womb by the power of the Holy Ghost. So also is her presence in the upper room essential for the formation of Christ's mystical body, the Holy Catholic Church. So she formed Christ's body in her womb. She formed the mystical body in her womb and gave birth on Pentecost. Now, this inclusion opened on Pentecost will close at the end of the trials of the church on earth. That is the second coming of Christ, the end of the church militant. Given the nature of God's inclusions, we can surmise with great certainty that the woman will have some essential role to play. We know this is true by the writings of the saints and as we've already noted from the prophecies of the book of the Apocalypse. But here's from St. Louis de Montfort. The salvation of the world began through Mary, and through her it must be accomplished. Interesting. In the second coming of Jesus Christ, Mary must be known and openly revealed by the Holy Ghost so that Jesus may be known, loved, and served through her. Same in the second coming as it was in the first. As she was the way by which Jesus first came to us, she will again be the way by which he will come to us the second time, though not in the same manner. Somehow she's going to usher him in mysteriously. And this is my own paraphrasing. 
In the final battle between our Lord and the devil, the Blessed Virgin must have a decisive role as God has placed enmity between them and has willed the Virgin to definitively crush its head. We wonder when this inclusion is going to close, huh? How long, O oh Lord? So, somehow, she's going to be there at the end, folks. Hmm. If that's true for the whole church, what about for her members? Applying what we've learned about the scriptural bookends of the woman, we are forced to conclude that without the Virgin Mary, no man can be saved. She's the neck. He's the head. We're in the body. If you want to be saved, you've got to be in the body. Who's going to save you? Christ. He gives you the grace. Where's it going to come from? Through the neck. Again, she is the sphere of God's omnipotence. He has ordered things such that he will not work outside of her realm. Is this not the message of Our Lady of the Miraculous Medals? She's showing all these rings and saying, these are the graces given to the world by God, passing through my rings and my hands. So many souls worldwide are crying out for help, falling in the terrible struggle over taking the globe, unable to conquer some evil or bad habit. What's the answer? It's the woman, the ark, and what she contains in her womb. Time and time again, we see the saints passing through the darkest times. They survived. How? They even thrived because of their unfailing devotion and consecration to Our Lady. They had entered into her realm to find grace, light, and truth, and heavenly aid. Now, just as the church as a whole mirrors the physical life of our Lord on earth, having its own outer layer of inclusions, so too the individual member mirrors the public life of His Majesty. We all started with the woman at baptism. She is our mother. The baptized are born twice. Once of a biological mother, more or less secretly, privately, hidden, but the second, publicly, at the waters of baptism before the whole world. And we're born the second time of a spiritual mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary. Thus His Majesty said to us, Amen, Amen, I say to you, unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What is more, we are born publicly, as I've stated, visibly for all to see at the baptismal font in the baptismal waters. So we're asked, are you born again? Yes. And I know the day. I hope you all know the day of your baptism. That's more important than our day of our physical birth. But what is more, we can say to them, well, I have a mother. Who's your mom? I was born again. And my mother is the Blessed Virgin. Giving birth to me spiritually at the foot of the cross. And that's why she was in pains of labor in the 12th chapter of the Apocalypse. Because we have sin. She had no pains of labor for the Christ because he had no sin. That's why she is seen in labor in Apocalypse chapter 12. One ancient writer told us this. We men are conceived twice. To the human body, we owe our first conception and to the divine spirit. The second. So, what's the spouse of the Holy Ghost? Our Lady. And so he overshadows her and brings forth life. She is our mother. Recall the final verse of the 12th chapter of the Apocalypse that we heard at the start of this conference. And the dragon was angry against the woman and went to make war on the rest of her seed who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Who are these offspring? These are the baptized. After all, St. Paul says that Christ is the firstborn of many brethren. Who are these brethren? The offspring of the woman who is designated to crush all heresy, to crush the head of the dragon, and even to participate in crushing death itself. Thus we pray at the end of the Hail Mary. Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. 
That's the death of St. Joseph there. She was there. In other words, to be a part of this tremendous task of crushing the head of Satan, who is now unleashed on mankind, we need to let this inclusio of Our Lady start it at our baptism, come to its fulfillment through our holy and happy death. Through our baptism, we entered into the sphere of God's omnipotence. Glory and honor and salvation await the offspring of the woman who remained faithfully inside that sphere. Wear your brown scapulars. Wear your miraculous medals. Don't let any nurse or doctor take those off you when you're sick or in the hospital. Put them on your friends who are dying if you can. Now, this wonderful pattern, this truth about God and His plan is also on display for us in nature. It's wonderful to behold. Most notably, the salmon fish. Several kinds of Pacific salmon are spawned in the clear, fresh waters and different creeks and rivers far inland from the salt water of the ocean. There's like five different kinds. After some months, the minnows begin their journey downstream starting at night. Imagine that. The minnows go down the creek to the rivers and then out into the ocean. There they live on average three years. After which time they go back up the river, switching from the salt water back to the fresh. Once they hit the fresh water, they do not eat anything but swim and overcome incredible obstacles and like rapids and waterfalls as high as 10 feet. And many predators, including bears and humans. They're not discouraged at the obstacles, but are compelled to get around them with all their might. For the salmon, this is an all-or-nothing affair. Some swim up to a thousand miles to reach their home waters. When they finally make it home, they're often scarred from the trial, even missing body parts such as fins. Once home, they lay their eggs and die. But new life comes forth. This is a sort of symbol of life in Christ and His Blessed Mother. Our Lord comes forth from the fresh waters of heaven as a minnow. Being conceived and born of the Blessed Virgin Mary, he comes at night, midnight mass, right? And then goes forth into the world, the briny salt water ocean, for his hour has come for about three years. And when the time to return home arrives, he swims back, vanquishing every obstacle for our sake. He is deeply scarred at the end, dies and rests on the bosom of his mother. Yet new life comes forth, the church and all her sacraments. Inclusio pattern, I hope you see it, is obvious in that. You start, you go out, you come back. Where you ended up, you come back. You could also use the Exodus Hereditus theme of the scholastics. But anyway, the Holy Ghost seeks to make us like Christ, so this pattern fits us too. We're like the minnows he has spawned through the waters of baptism and are born spiritually of the woman if we remain in the sphere of God's omnipotence. We have the gifts of the Holy Ghost and the all-powerful intercession of the woman to guide us and help us in the briny ocean of the world. The salmon has an incredible ability to smell his home stream. Scientists have determined that they can detect, that is, salmon can detect One part per billion, folks. That's like tasting a tablespoon of salt in the equivalent of 18 Olympic-sized swimming pools. That's one billion tablespoons of water. It turns out to be 18 Olympic-sized swimming pools. So the fish can detect a tablespoon of salt in that much water. And so, in like manner, will the Holy Ghost give us the ability to avoid evil, to detect the smallest errors and lures of the devil, overcome all obstacles without discouragement, always discerning which way to go to become another Christ, to be united to him forever in heaven through Mary, his mother. Also, 
By dwelling in the Spirit, we come to realize that we're not at home in the world. This is not our home, folks. It says in the Bible, chapter 13 of Hebrews, we have no abiding city. We are meant to die in the fresh and clear waters of grace, however, meant to die as our Lord did in the bosom, on the bosom of Our Lady. When consecrated to her immaculate heart, we will feel compelled to return to the sacred temple and sanctuary of the Holy Ghost. We will be homesick. As a result, the Holy Ghost, the spouse of the Virgin, will provide for us, helping us to overcome each and every obstacle of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Helping us to go without food and other worldly comforts and to suffer great trials and to swim upstream. It will be an all-or-nothing affair. No scandals will hinder us. No interior trial will detain us. The saints have taught us how to do this. Total consecration to Jesus living in Mary, renewed daily along with the devout recitation of the Most Holy Rosary, making three Hail Marys in the morning and three Hail Marys at night for purity. We want to start our day with Our Lady. We want to end our day with Our Lady. Inclusio. Praying for purity. Our Lady gave us the first Saturdays. Let's make it a way of life, not just on first Saturdays. We ought to make them a way of life. St. John Vianney went so far as to offer each hour for Our Lady reciting a Hail Mary at the chime of the bells at the top of the hour. Here is this hour for you. No wonder he was so powerful before God and all men. Now there's one more ultimate inclusio that's not as direct scriptural literary device as I've shown you the others. It's the whole created order. Now we have it on the writings of the saints based on scripture from the Proverbs chapter 8 verse 22. From the beginning... Ab initio, God willed the lady. She's right there. And there's the son in his mind as he's making Adam. And then here's the final judgment. And that's our Lord. And then on his right is our lady, real close. So you can see here's the very beginning of creation. In the mind of God, he's already got the lady and the son. And here's the end with the lady and the son. Let's just quote some popes on this. This is Pope Pius IX. He says in his Ineffabilis Deus, his definition of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, very first paragraph, he said, From the very beginning and before time began, the Eternal Father chose and prepared for His only begotten Son a mother in whom the Son of God would become incarnate and from whom in the blessed fullness of time He would be born into this world. And then he goes on to say, By one and the same decree, God has established the origin of Mary and the incarnation of the divine wisdom. And that decree preceded the making of Adam. So Our Lady was already in the works at the beginning, even before Adam and Eve. Okay, and there she is at the end. So, up there it says ab initio, so you can get the very outside. There's the general judgment at the bottom. See? Now we go to the other ones we've talked about. Genesis 3.15, woman, seed, and offspring. In Apocalypse, woman, offspring, battle with victory over dragon. See? Then Exodus, Apocalypse. Luke, so entrance of Christ into the world. Here's the closing of it. His exiting from the world, the ascension. Here's Canaan, Galilee. Here's the crucifixion and death. Now we look at ours. We have the Pentecost. That's the beginning of the church. There's the closing of the church. Our beginning and our end within her confines. You see, it's all very symmetrical and beautifully arranged. It cannot be denied. So God's inclusios of Our Lady, what's the significance? Once again, to begin and end well, devotion to Our Blessed Lady, the Mother of God, is nothing less than indispensable. Just as a woman, the Blessed Virgin Mary, is present at the beginning of all God's works, so also is she present at the end and all that goes in between. Once again, she's Virgo Potens, sphere of God's omnipotence. 
We can't stop there, though. We're almost done. But with this understanding, we have a great tool in our hands now. We can understand something about what is going on in the world at this moment and has always been going on off and on here and there. What happens when things of this world are not found inside the sphere? What does that mean? Not inside these inclusios, not part of the woman, her offspring, and the Ark of the Covenant and all that it contains. They're not within the bookends of God. Such things are not within God's plan, in other words. His directly willed plan, he may permit things. One can easily see that anything landing outside God's sphere falls into the sphere of activity of another woman mentioned in the scriptures. So that you can see why there's two women. There's the harlot who sitteth upon many waters, Apocalypse chapter 17, which, what are these waters? The peoples, the nations, and the tongues. In other words, popular opinion. Everybody's doing it. we got to go along. Everybody's bowing down to this woman. St. John goes on to describe her as a woman riding on the dragon. In other words, any attempt to make the church, we're going to get real direct now, because it's happening not just outside the church, there's the harlot out there, yep, but we, oh, we're safe over here. Wait a minute. Something's happening. I'm going to say this very clearly. Any attempt to make the church or her members say something or do something that is not inside of the inclusios of Our Lady is to strike deeply at the sphere of God's omnipotence itself. Which is the same as inviting and encouraging the activity of outside agents. Namely, the harlot and her dragon. All of which will only bring ruin upon us, as the scriptures say. An example of this in our own day would be to make the church in some official way, even pastorally, approve of divorce and remarriage, as well as other perverted unions in any way whatsoever. So if they're going to give manna from the golden jar to divorced and remarried or people in perverse unions, this is to strike deeply at the sphere of God's omnipotence and will bring ruin upon us. Can it be that the mystic, blessed Elizabeth Canary Mora, and that's Sister Lucia, can it be that blessed Elizabeth Canary Mora saw something of this effort on Christmas of all days? Interesting, 1816. She saw Our Lady who appeared extremely sad. Upon inquiring why, Our Lady answered, Behold, my daughter, such great ungodliness. Blessed Elizabeth then saw apostates, people who once believed and have left. We have a large amount of apostates today, folks. She said, apostates brazenly, she saw them trying to rip her most holy son from her arms. Confronted with such an outrage, the mother of God ceased to ask mercy for the world and instead requested justice from the Eternal Father. Clothed in his inexorable justice and full of indignation, he turned to the world. At that moment, all nature went into convulsions. The world lost its normal order and was filled with the most terrible calamity imaginable. This will be something so deplorable and atrocious that it will reduce the world to the ultimate depths of desolation. Blessed Elizabeth Canary Mora, 1816. This is what happens when a different sphere of power is sought after, when a new woman is desired. When marriage, who represents the church, the bride and bridegroom, new Eve and new Adam, when that is taken apart and a new woman is sought, this is what you're going to get. Did Sister Lucia see something of this when... She stated to Cardinal Kafara in a letter these telling words that has only come out recently, in the last couple of years or a year. She said, The final battle between the Lord and the reign of Satan will be about marriage and the family. 
Don't be afraid, because anyone who works for the sanctity of marriage and the family will always be fought and opposed in every way, because this is the decisive issue. And then she concluded, however, Our Lady has already crushed his head. Today, we have looked upon the Virgo Potens, the spear of God's omnipotence. For those who want to enter inside and drink deeply as lovers, they will find the wonderful results in the saints like Venerable Mother Mary of Agreda. In her dwelling and operating inside this sphere, in her salmon-like swim upstream, she bilocated across the globe. She helped save countless souls. She greatly contributed to the preservation of the Spanish realm under Philip, King Philip IV and wrote sublime and pious works that are read to this day. To show all this was well done, she remains wonderfully incorrupt. And you see her there, although that's a wax on her. She is fully incorrupt and her body is on display in Agra de Spain to this day. Let us enter this celestial sphere and lovingly be lost within, never to find our way out again. And I'd like to end with this beautiful prayer penned by St. Aloysius Gonzaga. O Holy Mary, my Lady, into thy blessed trust and special custody, And into the bosom of thy tender mercy, I this day, every day, and in the hour of my death, commend my soul and my body. To thee I commit all my hopes and consolations, all my trials and miseries, my life and the end of my life. That by thy most holy intercession and by thy merits, all my actions may be directed and disposed according to thy will and that of thy Son. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.